What do the next six months look like for both Ukrainian and Russian forces? Let's bring in Marina Miron. She's an honorary research fellow in the Defense Studies Department's Center for Military Ethics at King's College in London. Marina, it's good to have you with us this evening. So here we are, six months into this war, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. This week, Russian President Putin said we need to boost the size of the military. What does that tell us about how the war has gone so far for Russia, and what does it tell us about where it's headed? I think it's an interesting question because um, it is a way, a direct reply to the aid coming from the United States, the recent announcement by Joe Biden's administration. And I think that is Russia's response signaling the fact that the war is not going to end anytime soon. As a matter of fact, uh, perhaps during winter, both Russia and Ukraine will have the chance to regroup and recover to resume operations in spring. But we're in for a long haul here. And the latest $3 billion U.S. military aid package uh, that was announced this week, I mean, it includes more high-tech weapons, uh, air defense systems, radars, artillery systems. I mean, what does this tell us about how the U.S. now views the Ukrainian military? I think for the U.S., it's a sign of commitment to Ukraine, because in the past weeks, um, there have been a lot of publications trying to discredit the Ukrainian army, their, their efforts, um, especially in relation to the nuclear plant, as well as human rights abuses. So it's a sign that U.S. is still committed to supporting Ukraine and that it believes in the fact that the Ukrainian army can withstand Russian aggression. Moreover, it's important for the Biden administration, given the upcoming elections in November, to set a mark and hopefully to send a message to the allies who have been slowing down their support to Ukraine because of their own national interests to throw their support behind the Ukrainian army. And this has been shown in recent attacks on Crimea and um, also the Antonovsky Bridge, which have been successful um, from a tactical perspective. So the idea is um, supporting more weapons. However, these weapons are defensive in nature. Mm -hmm. At least there is hope that the um, Ukrainian armed forces can stop Russia from advancing on the front lines. Yeah, and these weapons systems like the HIMARS rocket systems, we know they give Ukraine an increased military punch, a boost, if you will. Um, what about the psychological impact, though, of these weapons deliveries? Uh, what's been the impact of these deliveries on both sides? I think it's very important to look at this war from both perspectives. There is an information dimension to this war. So announcing these deliveries is um, strategically a mistake because the enemy, the Russia, is knowing and is preparing for the fact that these deliveries will take place and will be trying to get information on where um, the logistics, uh, the logistic routes are, and try to target them. So you think so the U. In, in you think the U.S. So Marie, you think the U.S. should keep this secret when it is planning to send another billion or two billion dollars of weapons to Ukraine? I believe it would be wiser. But mm -hmm. as I said, there are two dimensions to this. There is a psychological dimension, mm -hmm. and the morale of the armed forces of Ukraine is crumbling their war fatigue, same as the Russians. So it's important to show that the West is still behind Ukraine and that they are getting the support that they badly need. And this reinforces the position of Zelensky as a president who can keep his promise to deliver these weapons to the front. However, there is a downside that the Russians, um, they should be deterred by hearing that they're, that Ukraine is getting these weapons. However, that also gives them the chance to prepare. They are waiting in anticipation. They know what's coming and what's going to be facing them. Mm -hmm. And from that perspective, it's not very wise to disclose what exactly is being mm -hmm. delivered uh, and in what quantities or what types of weapons. I want to ask you, we heard a lot at the beginning of this war about the fears of large-scale cyber attacks from Russia in retaliation for Western 
weapon supplies or for, for economic sanctions. But um, you know, the, the, the fears have not been borne out um, in reality. Have we overestimated Russia's uh, cyber capabilities here? I think it's quite an interesting question that gets posed quite a lot because everybody was expecting a nuclear, um, cyber holocaust. And there have been indeed some isolated cyber attacks which on the battlefield preceded uh, kinetic strikes. However, we haven't seen the uh, full capability of Russia's cyber arsenal. And the reason for that can be A, that they are lacking these capabilities. However, the more likely scenario is that it's not worth um, stepping up the stakes and showing their hand, because essentially Ukraine is not the main enemy for Russia. It's a NATO alliance. And so using their secret weapon, their war-winning weapon, because that cyber has been described as such by Russian sources, early on in the Ukrainian war is just a waste for Russia because uh, there is a fear that um, these weapons will get out there and will be reverse engineered the same way it happened with sandworm. So there is no strategic utility as of now. I mean, in terms of military equipment, Russia is not leading a war. Russia is leading a special military operation. It's not committing all of its forces. It's not committing all of its technology to Ukraine. So that same logic applies to cyber, just they are keeping the best for later on when when the real danger of confrontation with NATO states um, looms closer. That's more likely when Russia will try to use its offensive cyber and probably not against Ukrainian targets, but rather against Western targets. Yeah, and we certainly hope, of course, that day never comes. Marina Neron from King's College London. Marina, we appreciate your time and your insights. Thank you. Thank you. Residents of a small town in eastern Ukraine are burying their dead after this week's devastating Russian attack on the Ukrainian Independence Day. At least 25 people, including two children, were killed by Russian rockets in the small town of Chaplina. Our correspondent attended the funeral of one of the children who was among the victims. Matvi would have had his first day of school next week in peaceful times. The six-year-old boy will not live to see this day anymore. The whole neighborhood came to say goodbye. He was the most precious thing in my life. It's all so incredibly sad. For my daughter, there's nothing left. She doesn't even have a home anymore. Matvi was a quiet boy, his grandmother says. His home was directly across the street from the town's train station. The family was just getting ready for dinner when Russian rockets started to strike the neighborhood. Matvi was playing in the living room when the shelling started, and then he ran over to the kitchen where some other family members were, and that's when the rocket hit and killed the little boy immediately. Russia claimed responsibility for the attack. The military said it wanted to destroy a train that was supposedly carrying Ukrainian soldiers. And they apparently considered the death of Matvi and many others as acceptable collateral damage for their operation. It's the worst tragedy that has ever happened in the small town of Chaplina, the mayor tells us. But it brought the community together. The parents of the dead children have gone through an incredible amount of stress. We know it's very hard for them to go on with life. But at least we try everything possible to support them. Besides Matvi, an 11-year-old boy from the same neighborhood died in the attack. The war has already cost the lives of more than 1,000 children. And the two boys from Chaplina probably won't be the last.